Say amen. amen. Beautiful, beautiful song. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that has participated and will be participating today. And good morning again and happy Sabbath. We welcome each one of you to our service today and especially the visitors. We hope that you will receive a blessing and join us again real soon. You notice in the bulletin, we have an afternoon meeting at 2 o'clock after the fellowship meal. I do pray and I hope that each one will come and listen for the message that the Lord has prepared for you. And there's no question in my mind that you will not enjoy the vegetarian meal that the ladies have prepared for you. And also, they have decorated the fellowship hall beautifully. And I think you'll enjoy, I know you will enjoy the meal and the fellowship. Carolyn and I have had several conversations since I first contacted her. I almost feel like I know her because we have talked so much. And I'm so happy to have Jim and Carolyn with us today. Would you come up? I would like to share with you a little bit about them. Thank you. This is Jim. <laughs> this is Carolyn. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, Jim and Carolyn are volunteer field representatives of the Adventist World Video, uh, Radio. And Carolyn has experienced God's grace and strength in her own life, especially during the aftermath of an unexpected divorce. And then later, battling breast cancer. She's a retired teacher, a missionary to Africa, an editor of the Guide magazine, and Christian TV host. Carolyn has authored several books and numerous articles. She currently edits the General Conference Women's Ministry Yearly Devotional Book. Both Jim and Carolyn have enjoyed several years of involvement in prison ministry. She is the producer and speaker of Staying Vertical, an inspirational weekday segment from WFMH, the big 95.5 in Northwest Alabama. Now Jim, before his conversion, he was a freewheeling, multimillionaire dealer with Shell Oil Company. He spent most of his adult years pursuing wealth and pleasure. When he exchanged the world for Christ, he lost nearly everything he worked so hard to accumulate, including his immediate family. He has shared his testimony in Central America, Canada, the South Pacific, Alaska, and on 3ABN and Better Life Television. Jim also hosts a weekly Bible discussion program entitled Living the Truth on WFMH. Jim and Carolyn also enjoyed several years of involvement, as I said, in prison ministry. They've been married for 20 years. This week. This week. This week. Mm -hmm. Happy anniversary. <clears throat> Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Jim and Carolyn has blended families, includes two adult children, two daughter-in-laws, and three grandchildren. Their home base is in Phil Campbell, Alabama, but they worship in their local church near Florence, Alabama. We welcome you, mm -hmm. and I'm so Thank happy you. to have you here. 
And at this time, I've asked Jim if he'll say a few words about the man to man. First of all, I'd just like to welcome all the men to stay by this afternoon. And you're gonna hear how Jesus is not afraid of the devil. Mm. How he came right down in the pits of hell and took me, this country boy, by the hand and gently led me out of the pits of hell to a better road to travel on. If you wanna hear about that, come, and, come after lunch. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Gloria. Okay. Good morning, officially again. <laughs> I, wanted, I want to thank the praise team uh, for that beautiful music this morning. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, Jessica, for the children's story, to hold the attention of little ones is a challenge, and I know that from my teaching years. And also Heather for that uh, um, amazing special music, Amazing Grace, oh man, that's my song. And that's probably not my place, I still wanna welcome your new pastor, Pastor Jay. And I say that because we feel like we know him uh, just kind of by proxy. We have some family members that are grieving now in one of the churches that he just left, but their loss will be your gain. And we're all in the family of God doing, doing the work, but we're excited for you as well. I want to thank Gloria for the invitation to be here this, this Sabbath with you folks, and also for any of you who were involved in praying me through the stomach flu earlier this week. Um, this has been a, a challenging year, I'm sure, for a number of us with the flu epidemics. Uh, schools are closed up in our neck of the woods because, because of that, so it, it's just a double blessing to have been here. I've entitled this morning's presentation, Woman Overboard or not. I could just as easily have entitled it Man Overboard because the principles that are found in God's word are usually, for one gender, are usually applicable for the other gender and God needs both men and women in the body of Christ to help finish the work. And amen to that. And it's my habit before I launch into a presentation to bring you a public service announcement. And my public service announcements come from everywhere. They come from Burger King, they come from the cat at the barn at our, on our property. But this morning's public service announcement comes from a little five-year-old girl who was at the Pennsylvania Conference camp meeting a number of years ago with her family. And one day, when the meeting finished in the kindergarten tent, she came running across the yard, the, the big lawn there at the academy, and ran into the arms of her grandmother who was leave, leaving, just, we had just finished the women's ministry seminar, and she, and she said, Grandma, Grandma, I'm so excited, I finally understand it, I get it, I get it, Grandma. And her grandmother said, Sweetheart, slow down and tell me, what is it that you finally understand? And the little girl said, after what they told us in our meeting today, I finally understand that God loves us so much, he just can't take his eyes off of us. And that is my public service reminder to you that God loves you, and he loves you, and he loves me so much, he just cannot take his eyes off of us. Because as with Israel of old, whom he told, and we read this in Deuteronomy 32.10, that he considers you and he considers me to be the very apple, the very pupil of his eyes. And that's certainly why he cannot take his eyes off of us. And we need to trust that word of his to us. Let's have a further word of prayer before we begin here. Precious Lord, thank you for bringing by your grace this precious congregation, each one of us here this morning, and uh, it may not have been stomach flu, but something else, we all have challenges in our lives. But how grateful we are that the principles and the promises of your word are for each one of us. So whatever our individual challenges this morning, our common need is to be filled with the mind of Christ so that we can leave here today and function with a sense of your peace in our hearts. Thank you so much for being with us during this sacred hour. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We live in stormy times, don't we? Stormy times. It's hard to know who or what to trust anymore. There's financial uncertainty. There's fake news. There's street rioting. 
But I don't believe there isn't a person among us this morning who doesn't want to feel safe and secure and happy. Yet because we live in this sinful world, those storms will sweep through. In a group this size, there has to be an individual or two here today who is feeling as if they have been recently struck by a storm, if not even swept overboard into a sea of loss or pain or uncertainty or broken dreams or confusion or crisis. These storms can come from anything, a debilitating automobile accident or abuse in an early life or terminal disease diagnosis or the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one through death or divorce. And in order to survive these storms as children of God, we need to have survival strategies. Now, soon after moving to Alabama, actually, we had just uh, purchased our home in Alabama six, a little over six years ago to um, moving down from Tennessee to be closer to Jim's side of the family. And um, we had just signed papers on it. And the next day was April 27, 2011. And that day, as we hunkered down when that EF5 tornado came through in our relative's bathroom and peeked out <laughs> and saw, you know, sheets of metal and tree branches and whatnot flying around, and Jim, you know, of course, we were praying, claiming the promises of Psalm 91, and Jim said to me, did anyone say anything to you about tornadoes before we moved down here? And I said, no, didn't they say anything to you? So in order to, and so soon after that, when we got into our own place, we had a storm cellar installed, a little storm shelter there, and put it in the front yard, told the neighbors the door is always unlocked, whether we're there or not. That's one of our strategies for surviving tornadic storms. But as Christians, we need to have storm survival uh, tactics as well. Now, I'm neither a pastor nor a therapist, but I do know what it feels like to be swept overboard by a sudden storm in life. And so does someone else. His name is Jesus Christ. And since he knows how it feels and since he knows how to survive storms on this earth, he has given us in his word some storm survival tips. And this morning we're going to look at just two of them. And they come from an actual storm story in the Bible. First of all, we will review this story and then we'll pick out those two storm survival uh, strategies. Now this story is found in, and you can take your pick, Matthew 14, Luke 6, or John 6. It's there in all three of those, Matthew 14, I'm sorry, not Luke, Mark 6 or John 6. And each of these chapters recounts how late one afternoon, Jesus turned a small boy's lunch into a banquet for well over 5,000 hungry listeners. And that was after a full day of teaching and healing and preaching and encouraging. You may also recall that at the end of that day, there was a groundswell among his listeners. And the popular sentiment that began sweeping over the multitude was, we need to grab this guy and crown him king of our nation and get out from under the yoke of the Romans. Look what he can do for us. He just fed all of us. And even the apostles, the disciples of Christ, were caught up in this sentiment. And they began interacting with some of the people in the crowd, and Jesus saw what was happening. And he said, because he knew he had not come to set up a kingdom on this earth, to his disciples, gentlemen, I need you, folk, you guys to just go down to that fishing boat down there on the shore, get in, push off onto the Lake of Galilee, and I will meet you on the other side near Bethsaida. But I wouldn't put it past the brash, confident Peter to have said in a whisper to the Lord, Lord, are you kidding? This is the chance we've all been waiting for, come on. Let us crown you king. You can meet all our needs, and this nation can become great again. Please, Lord, this time, let us do this. Trust me on this one. Ever since Peter's time, there have always been people who thought it was safe to trust their own perspective 
and their own judgment. I've done that. Maybe you have too. And that usually destines us for some type of failure. A few years back, I was teaching in California, Sierra Nevada foothills. One of my teaching responsibilities was a very happy one during the winter months, January, February, and March. We took the whole school one day a week, and uh, we, we stopped PE classes during those months on campus, but we took all the kids, loaded them up on a bunch, bus, and made, had made special arrangements with the closest and the lowest ski resort there. Uh, to have ski classes Thursday morning and all Thursday afternoon, then the students could practice their skills and free skiing and so on. And all us, we teachers got to go along as you know, chaperones. We could take lessons if we wanted to as well. I remember the first day of the afternoon of one of those years, I was happily sliding onto a chair on a lift. I had been assigned certain slopes to chaperone, patrol, and check on how our students were doing. And, and just as the ski lift operator was getting ready to release the chair after I'd gotten on, all of a sudden, they thrust this orange-jacketed skier type with you know poles flinging and just into my chair, and his elbow just crunched into my ribs, and, and he just grabbed the edges and grabbed my knee with this hand, and it was just... And then our chair whisked up toward the top of the mountain. Trying to ignore the pain in my side, I tried to make light conversation, and I said, um, so how long have you been skiing? And the young man, bravado now, filling his voice, said, never tried before. This will be my very first sports history is about to be made here today. I said, excuse me, did you say your first run? Are you, are you aware? that when we get to the top, there are no beginning runs. There's an immediate, um, intermediate run to the left and an advanced run to the right. And he said, oh, I can do that. In fact, I can do any sport I put my mind to. You might say I'm a real natural. I said, but are you aware there are safety rules here regarding the more dangerous slopes? And he just cut me off with, do I care? Well, after that, I kept my own thoughts to myself. As we neared the summit, though, the young man started looking around, and he said, uh, so how do we get off of this thing? And my answer was, very quickly. That was my plan. I wanted to get off before he jumped or whatever he was going to do and crashed, which he did. After unloading, I headed down the intermediate slope to check on some of my students that I had spotted when I was up there riding to the top. While I was standing there chatting with them, my orange-jacketed former seatmate suddenly flew by, fast run downhill, on his back, arms and legs flailing. At the top of another run, a few minutes later, I scooted off the chair and encountered a most curious sight. Three uniformed patrol, ski patrol were subduing an individual in a familiar-looking orange jacket. As they strapped him onto a toboggan for mandatory downhill transport, I heard him loudly protesting, but I, I don't need you and I don't need your stupid regulations in sports, I rule, so this is how it's gonna be but the snowmobile fired up and drowned out the rest of his defiant words. Trusting in his own judgment, that skier wannabe had placed himself and others in personal danger, and it had also gotten him into a whole lot of trouble. On that mountainside that afternoon, Jesus knew that it would not be safe for him to abandon his disciples to their perspectives and to their judgments. It would put them in danger, it would put others in danger, it would put the cause of the kingdom of God in danger. So he ordered them out to cross Lake Galilee. You'll remember that the disgruntled disciples got into their boat. They pulled out onto the sea in that fishing vessel and their earlier excitement, that exciting day, that groundbreaking day, that day of miracles, faded from their minds and their excitement evaporated into resentment. And you can almost hear the accusatory sullenness 
And these words of John, as he records in his gospel, this is John 6, verse 18, it was already dark and Jesus had not come. And then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. And it must have been a great wind because in his account, Matthew, Matthew 14, verse 24, and then again in, in verse 30, Matthew describes these winds as contrary against them and boisterous, violent. So what was going on? I mean, weren't the disciples following Christ's command even at personal or political loss to themselves? What was with the, this pop-up hurricane? I'm wondering if you, like I, have ever felt as if you were heading toward a God-appointed destination, traveling in a manner that he had ordained, only to have a sudden storm come up against you, blowing you off course. And maybe you're experiencing some type of a storm right now, spiritually or financially or relationally. For years during my adult life, I experienced relatively smooth sailing as I headed toward eternity via a life filled with mission service in Africa and ministry and Christian education, and all within the context of what I had considered to be a rock-solid marriage. And then a contrary and boisterous wind began blowing. It was unleashed into my life in the form of a storm for which I was not prepared. Not Hurricane Wilma, not Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane unexpected divorce. And I suddenly felt myself being swept overboard, away from the security, the reality that I thought had been there during 23 years of marriage. And like the disciples, I found myself doubting that God loved me enough anymore to even notice what was going on. For the first time ever, I asked, where is God? Like John, in that Galilean storm, I began distrusting. The darkness has fallen on me, and Jesus has not come. Where is God? Why had, how hasn't he acted to allow this, un, to prevent this un, unspeakable loss in my life? And then in my intense emotional pain, and sometimes that does things to our reasoning abilities, I began to entertain the temptation to prematurely end my life because what was there anymore that was worth living for? But God, in his goodness, uh, interceded just in time. And also like the disciples who forgot about the feeding of the 5,000 and all those other miracles, all those other healing miracles, I too had forgotten God's innumerable blessings at that point in my life. God's innumerable blessings during those first 45 years of my life. Like the disciples, I too began focusing on just the negative, what hadn't gone the way I thought it should, and wondering then what I could do to save myself and maybe even my marriage. You know, lest we come down too hard on the disciples for throwing in that towel too easily, let's just remember that our own storms sometimes have driven us to the point of desperation and when we suffer a loss or a disappointment. In his book, Faith in the Face of Fear, author Don Hillier Jr. makes this statement. He said, seasons will occur in our lives that will not make any sense. Where are you, God? Was John's question that day, that, eve that night on the sea darkness all around and he hadn't come. I praise God that in the gospel account, Mark's gospel account, chap chapter 6, verse 46, God lets us know exactly where Jesus was at this segment of the disciple storm. It tells us that their Lord and ours was on a nearby mountain praying for them. Just as Hebrews chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 7 tells us, that that same Lord and Savior is up in heaven praying for us right now as we go through our storms. And addition, in addition to praying, Jesus was doing something else. Verse 48, 
we find out that he was watching over his disciples during this storm, just as he is doing now for us through the ministration of his heavenly angels and just through that wonderful Holy Spirit that we've been studying about all quarter in our Sabbath school lessons. My storm occurred 20, about 23 years after marriage, deeply wounded, and with a sense of barely being able to keep my head above water, I just threw myself into my teaching profession for the next six years, into my you know, teaching responsibilities and youth ministries responsibilities. And eventually I moved from California to teach for the Oregon Conference and attend grade junior academy up there. And there I joined a little country church for three reasons. Number one, there was no youth department, but there were youth in the church. They needed help with getting one started. Second, they needed another piano player. And third, there were no identifiable single men in that little congregation. The last thing I wanted in my life was any type of a male humanoid. Even when God later took me back to the Review and Herald to do some editing, I had an understanding with him. I don't remember he ever agreed to that understanding, but my understanding was that I, yes, I totally submit this divorce thing and this sudden change in life to you, uh, and I give you everything about it except my marital status. I will be in charge of that. And I, Lord, I just choose to be single the rest of my life, and I hope you understand, and that's the best plan. But after attending that little church in Oregon for a number of weeks, I began to realize I had been wrong about the church membership demographics. There were a couple of unattached men in the congregation, and one of them seemed to be a little bit interested. So I drew my cloak of self-protection around my unresolved storm damaged, damage and reminded God who was calling the shots in this area and went ahead and moved back to Maryland. I realize now I had a trust problem and God had to resolve that problem before he could completely heal me. In my storm story, I too, like the disciples, had huge questions about how I thought things should have been. Yet, guess who else has experienced great pain and consternation because of storms on this planet. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet he was without sin. In addition to the daily temptations that would normally come to mind, don't you think that our sensitive Savior in times of emotional pain, like the disciples, like you or me, would also be tempted to lose hope, to discard faith, and to wonder if God actually was with him. And we have only to recall his words in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross to know that, yes, he experiences the same, experienced the same emotions that we go through. Father, let this cup pass. My God, my God, hast thou forsaken me? You see, one reason God hates so much the evil side of suffering in our lives is because he remembers firsthand the suffering in his and how desperately sin hurts. Now, God is always consistent, as Dr. John Pauline says, but he is never predictable. And that's probably why at the midnight hour, the disciples suddenly saw what appeared to be a ghost walking across those hurricane-lashed waves of the Lake of Galilee. And for a moment, they probably thought the Grim Reaper had come to collect his dues, and they cried out in terror, and at their cry, that ghost turned and began coming toward them and speaking to them, and they recognized the voice of their master. It's all right, men. I'm here with you. You're not alone. Don't be afraid. That was Christ's word to them in that particular storm. And when the disciples recognized that their only hope in making it out of that storm was to trust the word of Christ despite the appearances around them, those raging waves and that heavy wind, the tide, and no pun intended, began to turn. 
and we've arrived at our first storm survival principle. Trust God's word. As simple as that. In the book Prophets and Kings, Ellen White writes, let the word of God, let the word of God speak to your heart. You know, King David was no stranger to life storms, and he wrote Psalm 119, 42, I trust in thy word. David lived by that storm strategy. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. By the way, that orange-jacketed skier wannabe wasn't the only memorable face on the ski slope that day. I remembered that afternoon, I, at between 3 and 4, I was supposed to chaperone patrol on the bunny slope where uh, our first and second graders were skiing. And I, I remember as I skied over there, seeing a little navy blue mound down in the snow, just kind of in a tangle of poles and, and, and skis. And I, I skied over and I heard a little voice, don't worry about me, teacher. The ski instructor told us to stand, how to stand up again on our skis if we fall. And I said, Toby. And he just finally popped up and I said, Toby, I'm so proud of you. Just the way you get right up and you keep on trying. And I shook the, picked his little knit cap out of the snow and shook the snow out of it and pulled it down over his ears again. I said, he said, I'm going up again. Want to come with me? And I said, sure. So we rode up the ski lift together and all the way up. He was saying things like, the ski instructor told us to keep the points of the skis together. The ski instructor told us to bend our knees when we get to those corners. That ski instructor sure knows a lot. The next week, Toby hardly fell at all. The third week, I was just so amazed, Toby's teachable spirit and his open-hearted trust in the unsurpassed authority and wisdom of the ski instructor and his word we're just making him into a, a, just a, a good little skier. The third week, I was assigned, uh, again, that what was called the face. The, it was the most dangerous. I was not a great skier, but I could make my way around. But I was assigned from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock to the face. And as I offloaded the top, uh, I was remembering that orange-jacketed guy, I, I skied off to the right, and I heard, hey, teacher. There you are, you wanna see something the ski instructor taught us to do today? And I said, Toby, honey, what are you doing up here? Don't you know this is an advanced run? And he said, I know, I know, but I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna ski down the face. And I said, no, you're not. I, I said, well, maybe we are, but you're not going by yourself. I said, just stop a minute. And I, I got between Toby and the first drop off and I started surveying how I would get my plucky little companion down that mountain. And I thought, well, maybe we're going to have to take our skis off and just walk down. I looked at, you know, 60, the, the, the slope was mogul studded, you know, 60 plus, just gigantic moguls. And, you know, it was after, you know, the afternoon was coming on and there was icy sp spots. And, and so I, I just thought there was a route maybe we could take that would, you know, kind of meander around. And, and so I said, Toby, Here's my plan. I could tell him I heard tips together, bend my knees, here I go, and whoosh, there he went right by me. And it was beyond help, and I saw him head right toward that first lip that dropped off onto the face. And I said, Toby, oh God, Toby. And I saw that navy blue cap just disappear. And then I saw it pop up again toward the top of the first giant mogul. Then I saw it disappear again, and with a hoop of exhilaration, I just saw up and down, up and down, tips together, and it's this tiny little wedge, and, and poles tucked under his armpit. And I said, God, please help Toby. And then I just breathed a prayer for safety, and with all my might, I took off in hot pursuit of my endangered little student. And I skied as hard as I could until everything went white. A few minutes later, I joined Toby at the base of the face. 
Hi, teacher. I saw you fall. <laughs> not just one time, not just two times. I saw you fall three times. But I just like how you get right up and keep on trying. <laughs> Thank you, Toby, I said, shaking the snow out of my goggles. You know, teacher, he said thoughtfully, the next time you might try bending your knees a little bit more. My return smile now was a little forced, but I made myself say, Toby, I'm proud of you. I cannot believe the progress you have made in just three weeks. And he beamed, I couldn't have. I couldn't have unless I did what the ski instructor told me to do. Teacher, maybe you could come to my ski week class and he could help you not to fall too. Toby had accomplished the impossible because of his choice to trust and submit to the word of the ski instructor who wanted only for Toby to be safe on the slippery slopes. There's an amazing promise in the book Patriarchs and Prophets 493. God will do great things, great things for those who trust in him. He will help his believing children in every emergency if they will place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. What word has God recently given you about a current storm? And are you prayerfully trusting that word? In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, talking about hopeless situations and life storms, he said these things with man are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And in my case, that meant emotional healing would be possible if I trusted the Word of God. And you know what the Word of God told me in Isaiah 54, 5? My maker is my husband. Down here, I might have been referred to as a divorcee, but I was still somebody's wife. And he would do what was best for me. His word told me in Philippians 4.19 that he would supply all my needs. His word in Psalm 37.4 told me if I delighted myself in him and in his will, he would grant me the desires of my heart, whatever those were. And six years into my unexpected midlife singlehood, I finally chose to trust the word of God, everything about my life, even my marital status to the word of God. And shortly after that point, God brought Jim into my life and I was able to listen and then follow God's voice because I was in a state of submission to his word. Survival principle number one, trust God's word. Survival principle number two, also from this biblical storm story, is simply this, trust God's timing. The disciples had cried out when, when they saw the ghost, and Jesus responded to their cry by coming to them. Then they were talking to him. He was talking to them back. He was still on the water. They were still in the boat. But just because they were communicating with him, and today we call this prayer, just because they were communicating with him didn't mean the storm was going to stop. The storm continued to rage, so the disciples had to make another choice. Do we trust his word and hold on until he chooses to end the storm, or do we give up? And they chose to just hang in there. Now, some of us, including myself, after we've prayed for a period of time for someone or some situation, have been tempted to stop trusting God when our storm didn't recede when we wanted it to. And we're tempted to take the, the, the reins back into our own hands and um, try to do something about our storms instead of waiting for God's direction. But at this point in the story, the disciples didn't do that. They chose to just hang in there. You know, Oswald Chambers once wrote, if our hopes seem to be experiencing disappointment right now, it simply means they are being purified. Every hope or dream of the human mind will be fulfilled if it is noble and if it is of God. And then Chambers concludes, however, one of the greatest stresses in life is the stress of waiting for God, the stress of trusting his timing. There are so many verses, I just chose one from the Bible, um, that encourage us to wait on the Lord 
Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage in the meantime, and he shall strengthen thine heart, but again, wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, you'll remember how the story ends, the impulsive, off the wall, impetuous, Peter, you gotta love the guy, says Jesus, you know, complete 180 turnaround from being terrified to, I, I wanna walk on the water too. And Jesus says, if you wanna be with me, come on. So wind whipping the hair of the big fisherman around his face, he steps over the gunnel. And as long as he keeps his eyes on Jesus, he walks across those stormy waves. But when he falters, as we do, all he had to do was cry out and Jesus was right there with a saving hand to draw him out of the water. Did you know based on John 14, 21 that Jesus has promised to reveal himself in our storms as well? I don't know how he's going to reveal himself in your storm as you trust his word and trust his timing. But I'll tell you one of the ways he revealed himself in my, my storm. My storm happened when I was living in California. One summer afternoon, I was down in Southern California visiting some relatives. They were both at work and I was, it was been a year since hurricane unexpected divorce had struck. And, and I was still trying to get things sorted out. And they lived just right near uh, Venice Boardwalk, uh, the beach there. And you know, there's always all these you know, hawkers and tourist crowds and whatnot. And, and you know, all of us have experienced feeling lonely even when we're with a lot of other people. But I decided I needed to walk. So I was making my way through the crowds. And I almost got run over by the man on roller skates wearing the long white robe. And he was trying to get around the crowd of people watching the sword swallowers and the fire eaters. You know, you kind of get the picture of the atmosphere there. And I was, my attention was suddenly drawn by a small crowd standing around the edge of a sidewalk right next to the beach. And they were gathered around a little uh, clean-cut looking man sitting. He had a little table, portable table in front of him with a typewriter on it. And he was typing away at this old-fashioned typewriter. And there was a little sign on his table that said, your autobiography for just $5. Well, that should have been my first clue because someone else doesn't write your autobiography. <laughs> they may write your biography, but you write your own autobiography. Anyway, being an English teacher, I, I, I stepped over there and I watched the man, fin he, and he finished evidently typing something. He pulled the paper out of the, the typewriter and, and he folded it in half and, and he said to a woman standing in front of him, here is a blockbuster novel of your life, ma'am in just 60 seconds, handed it to her, and sh she reached into her pocket and pulled out $5 and gave it to him. And I thought, whoa, five bucks for a piece of paper. He sure saw her coming. Then with a small hourglass in his hand, he was suddenly looking up at me. I don't know where all those other people disappeared to. And the 60-second novelist said, miss, May I write for you in just one minute a deeply relevant novel based on the story of your life? Only $5. I laughed in spite of myself, and then I grew sober again because there was nothing in life that was funny anymore. Well, first of all, I said, I'm, I'm not a miss yet. I'm, I'm not sure I'm a, still a missus. I don't know what I am. And then perhaps feeling safe behind a curtain of anonymity, I just blurted out, my marriage just flew apart. I never expected to be divorced. I don't think I even have a life anymore, so I'm just down here visiting my family. And to think my late father had raised me with his admonition throughout the years, Carolyn, don't talk so much. Don't tell the neighbors everything you know. The man, as he talked and I talked, was already putting a piece of paper in the carriage of that typewriter, and he said, my dear, there is always something to write about. So what's your first name? And like a big dummy, I said, oh, it's Carolyn. Carolyn, he said, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to write a blockbuster novel of your story. And with that, he turned over the little hourglass, and he began typing. The last grains of sand were just slipping into the bottom of that hourglass when he just spun the carriage, pulled out that paper, folded it in half, and there was a pre-copied cover on it. And he handed it to me, and he, he said, here you go, Carolyn. It's bound to be a bestseller. 
I said, yeah, right, rolled my eyes. And then, feeling obligated, I put my hand into my beach bag and gave him the five dollars out of which I had just been conned. Down at the beach a few minutes later, curiosity got the best of me. I sat down on a bench and I pulled the 60-second novel out of my handbag. The man had written a bare-bones account of a heroine named Carolyn, and he had written this. Carolyn once felt she was on the firm rock of a solid marriage. Yes, married for over 22 years, then someone foundered on the rocks and went down. Carolyn sent an SOS, but it was too late. Man had gone overboard. She knew not what to do. But she dived into the water, the rough waves of chance and opportunity, and she swam to the shore of stability again, and it's been a year. And she's even been visiting her brother's boat, where he lives moored to the dock. And I thought, yikes, did I tell him all that? Yet through the words of that off-the-wall 60-second novelist, God began revealing himself to me in my painful storm, particularly through those words, the rough waves of chance and opportunity. God reminded me that he alone is trustworthy enough to offer us second chances and provide new opportunities. He's the one who said in Isaiah 43, don't remember the former things are considered the things of old, Behold, I will do a new thing. Trust me. Suddenly I heard God saying, Carolyn, just give this to me. I have it. Trust my word. Trust my timing. And I remembered Romans 8, 28, God can use anything. And I thought, wow, do you think, God, do you really have, you still have a purpose for my life? Will it still have meaning? Obvious no longer, uh, no longer on the apparent solid footing of a long-time marriage that I thought I had, but, you know, my theme song became, became Anywhere with Jesus, I Can Safely Go. Suddenly, I didn't see myself as woman overboard anymore. I saw myself possibly as being right where God needed to be so he could work with me in ways maybe he hadn't been able to work with me before. Some of us today are experiencing a contrary and boisterous wind on our way to Bethsaida, aren't we? Our lives have not gone according to plan. We have been blown off course and maybe even swept overboard. Yet way too often, I suspect, we forget that our final destination never was Bethsaida. It never was a perfect marriage or just guaranteed financial security, or even a perfect church family. Our final destination is heaven. And submissive trust in God's word and submissive trust in God's timing are two of the best ways of getting there. The Gospel of Mark ends the Bible story for us and ends our time together. His closing words are these in Mark 6, verse 50. Then Jesus climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. As simple as that. In God's timing, that storm stopped. And what Jesus said to the disciples in that storm-tossed boat, that midnight hour, he also says to you today, and he says it to me, in the midst of our storms, be of good cheer. You are not alone in your storm. I am here with you. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Just trust my word and trust my timing. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. I am the Lord your God. You are precious in my sight. Sort of sounds like he loves us so much he can't take his eyes off of us, doesn't it? Isaiah 43. And I leave you with this final thought. Our creator... The master of the universe has not changed one whit since that stormy night on Galilee, which means he can still walk on water, which also means that when we, when we like Peter, keep our eyes on Jesus and a trusting hand in his, he will enable us to walk on stormy waves as well. I'd like to have a little prayer with you, even though it's not closing prayer time yet. Dear Father, you are too good to hurt us, too wise to make a mistake. Nothing comes as a surprise to you. Please help us submit all our stormy times to you. Give us the ability 
to trust you as you reveal yourself in your word. Give us the grace to wait for the outworking of your will and your perfect timing. And give us peace. We just thank you and pray these things in the name of the one who does love us so much. He has never taken his eyes off of us, especially when he was hanging on the cross in our place. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 530, It Is Well With My Soul. Please stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your blessings. And Lord, we've heard a lot about storms, these storms in this life that we're living here on this earth. Of course, you know all of that. We just ask that you keep us all safe until a storm passes by. And Lord, have each one of us ready to go home with Jesus when he comes. In his precious name, amen.